Good afternoon. My name is Susan Jennings. I'm executive director of the Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions. I'm really delighted to welcome everyone back. I hope that you've had a chance to be here for at least part of this amazing day. I've, I've been pretty astonished at how much um, how moved one can be even over Zoom. So thank you to the amazing presenters and for all the um, audience participation. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Chad Bittler. Chad actually um, spoke at our 2017 soil conference that we hosted um, in March of that year. And that was, or February actually. And that was the year that we um, bought Agraria and the purchase of Agraria came out of that uh, soils conference. So it was really almost a mythical time at this point and several of the people who were at that conference, including Maureen Don, who really got the ball rolling for us to purchase the farm, uh, are here today. So it's, again, just a really amazing honor to um, introduce Chad. And the other thing about Chad is after we did buy Agraria, he and his colleagues at Green Acres were very generous in helping us think about how we might use rotational grazing to build the soil that we had. So Chad is a research director at Green Acres Foundation, which is in Cincinnati. It's a nonprofit organization with a focus on education, research, and conservation. Chad leads Green Acres research with a goal to explore connections between regenerative agricultural practices and the outcomes on soil health, food quality, and the environment. Chad will be speaking about the use of rotational grazing in building regenerative soil systems. Chad, so glad that you are here. And I like the, like the picture of the bowl behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I swear my wife bought that. I was just as surprised as you were. <laughs> I was like, hey, uh, that looked great in my office. <laughs> So uh, let's see here, do some screen share. All right. All right, can everybody see that? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. We good? All right, I'm gonna assume that everybody can see that. I don't see otherwise. Uh, so let's get rolling. Well, first, Susan, thanks so much for having me. It uh, truly is an honor to be invited to speak at this conference. Uh, you know, I, I wish that we could all be in the same room, but um, with it being 2020, that's just the hand we're dealt today. Um, that said, a quick housekeeping, housekeeping item. I am actually uh, serving the last day of quarantine with my fourth grader. So instead of being in the quietness of my office at Green Acres, I am instead um, in the comfort of my home office. So if there's any loud noises from my children, I, I apologize. Or if you see me, you know, doing, doing this, telling them to, to go away for an hour, that is why. Um, uh, real quick, do want to apologize. So the, the title of my uh, presentation might be a little bit misleading. Um, it was called Rotational Grazing. Um, so if you're here to learn about the ins and outs of rotational grazing, um, I'm probably not the best person to discuss that being a researcher and not a farmer myself. Um, however, I do have the contact information of Jonathan Gabus, who's our manager of livestock operations at the end of the slideshow, and he'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I also see that Jim Linney's on here, and I'm sure he'd be willing to uh, help you out with that as well. He's a great grazer himself. Um, but what we are going to talk about um, is kind of the science behind cattle in a regenerative system. Um, that's one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, there's a lot of conflicting information about out there about, you know, are, are cattle detrimental to the environment or are they beneficial to the environment? And, um, you know, that's something that we're going to talk about today and really the science behind why I, I not only are cattle not detrimental, but I think they're actually essential for, um, for a truly regenerative system. <clears throat> 
so what we're gonna talk about, um, you know, another question I get a lot is what is Green Acres Foundation and how are you guys able to do what you do? So I'll just touch on that briefly, just kind of go over kind of who we are we're, what, and what we do. Um, and then I, I wanna start with kind of a, a scientific primer, so to speak, just kind of setting the stage uh, um, about how cattle actually work in this system. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, generative agriculture. Now, I'll use generative agriculture and regenerative somewhat interchangeably. Um, we prefer to consider it generative only because regenerative kind of has the connotation that we're trying to get back to a certain point, uh, whether that's a point soil health or ecological health or, or whatever that may be. But the reality is we don't know what our soils were like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. We don't know what our ecosystem was like 100 years ago. So the way that we view it is as long as we can show that we're consistently generating whatever our, towards whatever our end goal is, um, then, then we're pleased with that. So we just refer to it as generative agriculture. So we'll briefly touch on some principles of soil health, which are crucial to understanding um, gener regenerative agriculture as a whole. And then we'll get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it, um, how li what livestock's role is in generative land management. And then we'll go into some of the actual supporting data. So what data is out there? There's not a whole lot because to be honest, it's, it's fairly a fairly new study. Um, but what, what data is out there, not only in the literature, but also um, the data that we've collected at Green Acres as well. Uh, so Green Acres Foundation uh, it was founded in 1988 by Louis and Louise Nipper. Uh, Mr. Nipper was the great grandson of James Gamble, who was the inventor of ivory soap and also one of the founding fathers of um, Procter and Gamble. Um, he was an avid uh, cattleman, so gentleman farmer, as well as an environmentalist. Uh, Mrs. Nipper was a classically trained uh, opera singer. So really Green Acres is an educational nonprofit that kind of represents both of their interests. So we, um, we have a lot of educational opportunities for generative agriculture, environmental education, um, as well as music and the arts. So it kind of represents each of their main interests. Um, we typically see about 30 in a typical year not necessarily 2020, but typically we see about 30 to 35,000 kids uh, come to Green Acres each year for free educational classes. Um, so we've got two locations. Um, our main campus is in Indian Hill, which is just inside the 275 belt of, or the outer belt of Cincinnati. Uh, this farm was purchased back in the 60s by the Nipperts. Uh, at the time that they purchased it, it was actually a, um, uh, it was used for row crops. And shortly after, uh, Mr. Nippert converted it all over to pasture and started raising Black Angus cattle. Uh, today, we've actually added a few more in, uh, livestock enterprises onto it, uh, mainly poultry, both broilers, um, egg layers, as well as turkeys, which is a seasonal product for us, um, uh, obviously for the fall and, and Thanksgiving, uh, but we also have sheep as well as woodland raised um, Berkshire hogs as well. Uh, let me see here. So this picture here we may touch on later. This is actually a research project that we're doing right now looking at um, lay rotations. So actually for vegetable production, what role um, does livestock play in uh, nutrient availability for livestock production or for vegetable production as well. So you can see here, this is kind of a panoramic, but you can see uh, vegetable production right next to um, some cover crops that we actually graze. So this is a two year rotation of vegetables and then two years of, of intense grazing to build up fertility. So collecting a lot of data on this to try to prove the process. Um, our second location is actually out in Brown County in Lewis Township. So this is about an hour east of our main campus. We purchased this property back in 2018 
it was a spent um, soybean farm. So it had been previously a tobacco farm up until the late 90s and had undergone about 20 years of continuous soybeans since then. Um, it was no-till no farm. Um, as you can see, the two pictures on the left, uh, the far left, that was actually about a month after we purchased the farm and we were collecting some baseline data, you can see our transect here. You can see basically all that was growing was uh, mare's tail, some ragweed and some other uh, noxious weeds. Uh, so we went in, we tried to actually no-till no in some oats to get some cover crops on it. And this is three days after a heavy rain. Um, you can see the lines where we had uh, no-tilled in the oats about uh, three or four days earlier. And we had absolutely zero oats come in because the water infiltration was atrocious. So that's kind of what we were dealing with. Um, this was about three months after that, actually, when we were actually able to get some, some cover crops growing. We will um, compare and contrast these two sites a little later on with some of the data that we've collected. All right, so let's, let's get into it a little bit here. So um, I always like to start my presentations uh, when we're talking about this stuff with just kind of an, an overview of what the carbon cycle is, because this is one of the main drivers of, of regenerative agriculture. Um, this is actually very closely tied to the water cycle, so you can actually um, compare those, those, those two kind of walk hand in hand alongside each other, which we'll look at some data that, that shows that as well later. So what, what we're going to focus on here is mainly the left side of this chart, which is the terrestrial um, carbon cycle. Uh, so anything here that's in yellow, this would be the, uh, the natural cycle. Um, anything that's in uh, white would be our carbon pools, and then anything that's in red are our or anthropogenic um, impacts. So you can see here photosynthesis by and large is the main driver of the carbon cycle with about 120 gigatons of carbon per year pulled into the system. Um, what I do wanna mention is that everything that's in yellows in the natural cycle is completely balanced. So you have 120 in and then through respiration, you've got 120 out. Uh, we obviously offset that with our anthropogenic emissions uh, mainly through fossil fuels and land use change. Um, that said, uh, through photosynthesis, we can actually offset some of those, um, some of our carbon emissions uh, to, the, to the tune of roughly about three gigaton, gigatons of carbon per year. Um, let's, one thing I do want to mention is if we look at our carbon pools here, uh, we have about 2,300 gigatons of carbon in our soils where we've got about 800 in our atmosphere. So I might, not, I might argue that um, we don't necessarily have a carbon problem, we've got a carbon location problem. Um, so since the main driver of the carbon cycle is photosynthesis, I do wanna go over this real quickly, either, uh, real quickly as well, because this will be important uh, later on in the conversation. Um, so here's the equation for photosynthesis. And I think most of us can probably remember this from, you know, sixth, seventh grade um, science class, uh, you know, what, what I always remembered was, you know, plants pull in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. Well, kind of the unsung hero of this is what happens to that carbon once it's cleaved off and the oxygen is released. And simply it just forms a large, long carbon chain or what we know as carbohydrates or sugars. Um, so for the plant, why is that important? Well, you know, those, those sugars are essential to you know, the, the basic functions of that plant. So growth, reproduction, and uh, storage for you know, times, of, um, times of need. So what, what's often overlooked is you know, we know that those sugars are useful for us, you know, this little guy here, um, it's useful for herbivores, but what's often overlooked is what happens beneath the soil with those sugars. So those, um, those sugars are, 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 are traded off in a really intricate dance in the rhizosphere um, where those sugars are leaked through the roots um, as ex root exudates. And there's a bartering system that goes on as those sugars are leaked into the roots, the microbial life that's in that soil is now trading minerals and other nutrients that the plants can't get themselves in exchange for those sugars. 
So once those sugars are actually leaked down into that rhizosphere or down into the soil, those sugars now become, or those that carbon now becomes part of that, that soil process. So that's, that's how those, the, that carbon through photosynthesis is now getting into our soil. So the question now becomes, how can we positively impact photosynthesis? How can we improve photosynthesis? Well, with generative agriculture, one of the main things that we ask ourselves is, well, how does nature do that? So how, how is nature farming? So you can look at, you know, the bison and, and you know, this is huge here, the biodiversity that, that we can expect with, with nature. And I, I didn't get to hear all of um, Doug's talk earlier, but I did catch the tail end of it. And some of the things that he said definitely correlate to what we're going to talk about today with, um, uh, especially when it comes to agriculture and connecting these natural ecosystems. So in, in reality, it, it, for us, especially on our farm, it, it, it starts with our soil. And if we can get the soil right and humming and heading in the right direction, then everything else kind of falls into place. You know, we look at soil as, as the engine per, behind a productive system. And what's the fuel for that engine? Well, that fuel is carbon. And which makes sense because carbon's fuel for us. It's fuel for our vehicles. It's fuel for a lot of things. It's it's the fuel for our earth. Um, and so if we're using the metaphor of, you know, soil as an engine, well, with, with any kind of engine, we really need a, a good maintenance routine. It's the same with soil health. So what might that maintenance routine be? Well, you know, for us, it's, it's utilizing these five principles of soil health. That is our maintenance. So let's, let's touch base on those really quick. So the first one is just basically minimizing soil disturbance. So tillage is by far one of the most destructive things that we can do to soil. And the literature basically tells us that at least for the first 10 years, we know that with tillage, we're losing about, so if we're going from a perennial system or an undisturbed system, we're going to lose, once we start tilling, we're going to start losing about a ton of carbon per hectare per year, at least for the initial first 10 years, which is, which is huge. I mean, that's, that's um, you know, if, if, if we go back and we look at that, um, that photosynthetic equation, if you go in reverse of that, that's actually respiration. So what happens when these carbon chains are now introduced to oxygen? Well, that starts breaking down and respiration happens. And now we're putting off more CO2 into the atmosphere, which is detrimental to what we're trying to do by bringing, bringing um, CO2 out of the atmosphere into our soils. Uh, one way to combat that, especially if we're doing, you know, any kind of cropping is, uh, you know, these guys down here, this is actually one of our pastures where we're no tilling in some, um, some warm season covers into a cool season pasture, but uh, no till is, is pretty crucial for this process. Uh, the second principle of soil health would be maximizing soil cover. Now, preferably that would be with living plants, but it doesn't have to be. Um, that could be, you know, plant residues. It could be, you know, cover crops that have been roller crimped, such as in this picture here. Um, it could be green manures. It can be um, mulch layers. Uh, it can be living plants. Uh, this is important because it's gonna control our soil temperature. So it's gonna protect it from extreme cold and extreme hot, uh, you know, where, um, you know, in the middle of summer, bare soil may be 110 degrees uh, underneath um, a protected armor or these mulch layers, you, you know, it's gonna be more around 75 degrees, which is much more hospitable to our, our soil life. Um, it's gonna decrease runoff. So, um, uh, some of you may be aware of this, but um, the, the shape of uh, a rain droplet actually isn't what most people picture it as, this, you know, perfect sphere, like a dew drop. Uh, it's actually shaped like a pancake, um, more like this, more like really like a hollow point boilet, bullet. So imagine what that, ha what that does to hitting bare soil. Um, it's going to break it up and we're going to, we're going to have increased runoff. Um, it's going to protect it from elements. And of course, it's going to feed our soil life because even this stuff here, that's going to get broken down by 
uh, any macro or micro invertebrates we have in our soil as well as um, our soil biology. Um, living roots, this is, this is a huge one. Um, the more living root, the longer round, year round we have living roots in our soil, uh, the more photosynthesis we're going to have. And I, just based on what I've said earlier, I think you can understand how crucial photosynthesis is uh, to this process. Um, it's going to feed our soil. It's going to hold nutrients in place. Um, you know, this guy here, this is just collecting nutrients. And then once it breaks down, once it starts getting warmer, that's going to release those nutrients that it's scavenged from deeper in our soil pores um, and bringing it up closer to the soil surface where it's more readily available to the plants that are growing there. Um, it's also going to reduce runoff and increase water infiltration um, with the root structure. So this is actually a cool chart that um, some of you may know Peter Donovan. Uh, shortly after we purchased our farm out in Lewis Township, which uh, to remind you that was a, um, a spent soybean farm, um, he, Peter visited us and went out to the farm with us and he actually pulled this up using um, satellite imagery. So what we're looking at here, this is this graph shows normalized difference vegetation, the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, which is basically an indicator of live green vegetation. So anything above 0.5 here would indicate that photosynthesis is occurring. And what we see here is basically the cycle of a row crop um, conventional farm. So what we're seeing is you know, this is the, our x-axis here is um, days of the year. So, uh, you know, here we're January 1. And as we go along here around March, we start seeing a little bit of, of photosynthesis happening. And then with a no-till system here, we quickly see that killed off through likely glyphosate. And then our row crops go in. And then basically here in the summer, we see a big spike in photosynthesis. Uh, only to be harvested and then um, either sprayed or left fallow and no more photosynthesis happening throughout the year. Um, so this is pretty, pretty indicative of um, a conventional row crop system. And a pasture-based system, unfortunately, I don't have this chart to represent that, but we should see photosynthesis occurring kind of more like this. Uh, so year round. Um, we purchased the, the farm on day 169 of the year. So this was roughly about 20 days after we purchased the property. Uh, this purple here would be the year that we purchased it. Um, it had been sprayed before and we're, this is basically weed growth before we were able to get in there. Uh, the fourth, fourth one is increasing diversity. Um, you know, anybody who heard, heard Doug's talk earlier, just the, the few parts that I heard towards the end, I'm sure he probably discussed this a little bit uh, and just the importance of, of diversity you know, supports more life. Uh, wildlife increases productivity of both plants and animals. Um, obviously we want pollinators in our system. So this is some buckwheat that we, we planted. Uh, you can kind of see, um, it's a small picture, but right there I can see three honeybees on it. Um, adds resiliency to the system. So, you know, root structures deeper in years of drought, we're gonna see more productivity out of those plants as opposed to maybe others. Um, you know, warm season, cool season, those are all things we're looking for. This is actually one of our pastures here. So you can see the amount of diversity behind this uh, perennial ryegrass here. And then the reason that uh, we're here to discuss, uh, integrating livestock. So to me, this is one of the keys to soil health. Um, there's numerous reasons why. Um, first of all, nature farms with animals. Um, you know, grazing ruminants are part of healthy ecosystems. Um, and, you know, the, the native prairies were built with grazing bison. Um, they help with nutrient cycling. So if we're not, if we want to have systems where we're not adding nutrients or we're not adding inputs, we really need cattle or some sort of, of livestock input. That could be bone mill, blood mill, um, feather mill. It could be a lot of different things. It could be poultry, uh, but all of those are animal inputs that we need through, through livestock. Um, symbiotic relationships uh, between ruminants and plants are important, which we'll discuss. 
Uh, we found through some of the data that we're collecting that multi-species actually compound benefits. So the more species we have, you know, cattle followed by sheep, followed by chickens, the better benefits that we're seeing with our, our, our pasture health and our soil health. Uh, livestock increased soil organic matter can improve water holding capacity, uh, improves cation exchange or nutrient availability. So all these things come with, with increased soil organic matter. Uh, they can increase water infiltration with their hoof impact. Um, and uh, it can eliminate, like I said earlier, the need for external in inputs. Um, and also increases um, habitat for some of our ground nesting birds and, and the like. So some of you who may have come to uh, hear about rotational grazing, this is the one slide where I'll actually get into it just a little bit, but really at, at uh, kind of a 500 foot view, not, not getting into the, the specifics. Um, so, so really the, the key principles of this are, um, you know, what is overgrazing? So, you know, we refer to it as the law of second bite. It's not really a function of too many animals. It's how long are they, are they on the pasture? Are they in the paddock? So essentially, we don't want them going back and taking more than one bite. We want to get them in where they're grazing the top and then get them off of it to where they're not going back and they're overgrazing the, their favorite or the most nutritional grasses. Um, and then once we take them off of it, we're allowing that grass to um, regenerate. We're allowing it to, you know, use those carbon stores in its soil to, to now grow again. Um, so really it's not, uh, you know, cattle really get a bad rap or livestock really gets a bad rap. It's, it's not the cattle. It's, you know, as this says, it's not the cow, it's the how. It's literally how are they managed that, that drives the impact that they have on our, on our ecosystem or, or on our, um, really, I mean, even on downstream communities. So soil carbon sequestration, you know, I, this term is thrown around a lot. Um, so we're, we're gonna discuss that a little bit because I think it's important. Um, so, you know, how does this work? How does this fit within the carbon cycle? We've already touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, photosynthesis being the main driver, but how, how, do, how do cattle and plants integrate into, into this system to be able to sequester more carbon than let's say just a prairie that's left to its own devices. Um, you know, just grasses that are outgrowing without any human input or any livestock disturbance. How is that different from, from a, a managed pasture or managed prairie? So to get to that, we really need to look at what um, a plant response to grazing is. So to understand that, let's, uh, let's take a look at um, the growth curve of a grass plant. So, you know, obviously, grazing ruminants and plants have somewhat of a symbiotic relationship. Um, you know, plants, in my opinion, and is what the data shows, need ruminants or some sort of human interaction, whether that's through mowing or, um, you know, some, some other form, which is kind of counterproductive. Uh, if, if humans have to now go in and do it, um, the, the cattle do it for us for free. Um, but ideally, what we want to do is we want to keep the plants in a productive stage because plants or grasses are just like any other kind of organism. Their ultimate goal is reproduction. So once they get there, they've basically accomplished what their main goal is. So if we look at the growth curve of this, this grass plant, we see it's a sigmoid curve. Uh, we see it's really slow early on. And then once it hits phase two, call this maybe like the adolescent phase, um, it, it grows really quickly. So almost like the teenage years, it sprouts up really quick. Um, and then once it hits phase three and it's, it's shot that, um, that seed head, it's, it's, it basically looks at it as like, I've done my job, I've reached my goal, and now I don't have to work as hard. I can go into basically like a retirement phase. Um, and you see here in the growth curve, it actually starts to senesce. And what happens here are two things. One, it will actually start breaking down and actually start oxidizing, which is actually 
putting more CO2 up into the atmosphere um, through respiration. And the other thing is once we, once we start encroaching phase threes here, threes, phase three here, is this plant starts becoming more lignified. Um, so for the cattle that actually becomes less nutritional and um, actually increases the length of digestion, which can lead to actually greater methane production. So in a regenerative system, we're actually trying to graze the cattle around here. So around here, when this, this plant is still very productive and still really nutritious for the animal. Um, and essentially, so how are, how are we, this is how the cattle are keeping photosynthesis happening is we're coming in and we're grazing it before it gets to phase three. And now we're starting back down here. And now this plant has to start photosynthesizing like crazy. So it's using up its root stores, which I'll get to here in the next slide. And it's, it's starting to re-photosynthesize. This photosynthetic activity is now increasing instead of decreasing if we had let this, this plant go to seed. So to understand this, we need to understand what the plant's actual response to grazing is. So if anybody here um, has actually seen a root, uh, cattle in particular graze, they actually, they, they tear, they don't bite. So they'll go in, they'll wrap, wrap their tongue around, they'll rip. This is actually shown to cause an interesting um, cascade of events. So what happens once that, once that ripping occurs is now that plant starts shooting root exudates into the soil. And the reason is because it's trying to actually recruit microbes. As I mentioned earlier, those root exudates are there being put into the system because there's things that the plant needs that it can't get itself that the fungi and the, the microbes can get through mineralization and all these other things. Um, but those fungi and those um, soil microbes can't photosynthesize, so they need sugar. So this bartering system starts occurring. So again, starts putting more of these root exudates into the system um, because it needs to start obtaining these nutrients it can't get for recovery. So once this starts happening, not only are we increasing the amount of photosynthesis, but we're now increasing the amount of carbon that's being pumped into the soil. So after that occurs, we are now allowing that grass plant to rest. And then we come back 45, 60, 90 days, wherever we are in our grazing cycle, to regraze and restart, um, restart this, this entire process uh, throughout the growing, growing season. So the question then becomes, is soil carbon sequestration actually possible? Now, there are conflicting perspectives. Um, you know, I, I feel like I read both sides almost every day. Um, the supporters of regenerative agriculture uh, and livestock in, in general could say that, uh, that this system is a panacea. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a cure-all for uh, climate change, you know, a lot of, you know, community, downstream community issues, a lot of things. Whereas the opposition, you know, that could be people who are anti-livestock, people who are uh, promoting a more of a plant-based or plant-centric uh, lifestyle, um, or to be honest, the commodity beef industry, you know, they, they want to hold on to, to this, to their, um, their portion of the business as well. And, you know, so they can brush this off as a pipe dream. And so what's, what's the reality? Well, you know, that's, there's probably some truth to both sides. Um, you know, I'm kind of a middle of the aisle kind of guy. And, and I think that, you know, given specific circumstances, it's probably a little bit of both. So one thing that's really important to understand is that, you know, both, both the commodity cattle or commodity beef side and the plant-based and the anti-livestock side, one of the main arguments is always, well, this is worse for the environment cattle grazing is worse for the environment because they actually put off more 
more carbon into the atmosphere or more methane in, in, in the form of methane. Um, but that's, that's not exactly the whole story. Um, so if we actually look at the entire carbon cycle, cattle are part of the biogenic carbon cycle. And what I mean by that is they're not necessarily adding new carbon into this system. The carbon that's coming from the cattle in the form of methane is actually carbon that was already from the grass that they had eaten. So uh, this is from Diana Rogers, who um, she just wrote a book called Sacred Cow. Uh, and there's a, a documentary coming out as well. Um, but this is this, you know, I, I borrowed this from her. This is a great um, uh, image that, that shows exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, so, you know, I, I almost think of this as like the law of conservation of energy. If anybody's familiar with that is energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just, it just goes from one thing to the next. It's kind of the same thing here. So, you know, carbon in the grass is eaten by the cow. It's either belched out in the form of methane, which is then converted to CO2 in, in, in water eventually. So water comes down as rain, CO2 is pulled, drawn down through photosynthesis. Um, extra carbon is then exported out for either milk, meat or milk for our consumption, or as uh, manure, which then goes back into the soil. So um, that's one thing that's, you know, is important to understand. So now let's, let's get into um, some of the data. So this is a, uh, a paper that was out of Michigan State and published in 2018. And to date, this is probably the most fundamental paper or the most important paper that's been, been introduced um, in support of regenerative agriculture. And so what this, what this paper looked at um, was, and this was by Stanley et al. Um, in 2018, what this paper looked at was, um, you know, looking at a feedlot system. So here FL is feedlot, which is uh, indicated by the light gray, or a, for lack of better terms, a, a regenerative system, or what they refer to here as AMP, or adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And they wanted to do a life cycle assessment of both, um, both production methods and com compare uh, the carbon footprints of each. So these are reported here in kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of carcass weight. So in other words, for every, every kilogram of beef that's produced, how many kilograms of CO2 um, was that kilogram of beef responsible for? So if we, if we look at this chart here, um, it would be pretty much what, what we've been told um, that, you know, cattle grazing um, are going to emit more enteric methane than cattle in a feedlot system. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One reason is simply the cattle in a feedlot system are just on the planet shorter. So a typical feedlot animals on, uh, harvested in about 18 months. Whereas a typical grass-fed animal is going to be around longer, we're looking probably, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 months, just depending on the system. Uh, but they're going to be around longer. The other reason is that a byproduct of uh, rumination is um, or in, is enteric methane. You know, when an, a, a, an animal is ruminating, it's burping up methane as it chews it, you know, chews its cud and then swallows it back. That's just part of this, of, of the natural cycle of ruminants. Um, but that, that wasn't the whole story. So any paper that had been done up to this point had actually used models to try to understand how much uh, carbon could actually be sequestered in this, in this type of amp grazing. And the number that they had always used is 0.41 tons of carbon per hectare. So that, that all the models, that's, that's what had been told. And that every paper up to, up to um, this paper had basically used that model. Well, what this, what Stanley um, and the group had done was they decided that they were actually, 
going to collect soil data over or across a four year span. So instead of just saying, well, let's plug these numbers into the model, they were pushing the model aside and saying, let's actually collect data to see how accurate the model is. Well, what they found was, so per kilogram of carcass weight, yes, the, it appeared that the, the amp or the regenerative grazed cow or cattle, beef cow, was actually giving off about a third more methane or carbon into the system or emitting a third more carbon, its footprint was, was greater than a feedlot model. But when we actually look, taking into account the soil carbon flux, so how much soil carbon was being pulled into the system over a span of four years, the story completely changed. So for every one kilogram of beef that was produced out of their system, they were sequestering 6.65 kilograms of carbon into their soil. So this is a complete game changer. This completely changed how a regenerative system was being viewed. Uh, a couple other things that this study pointed out was um, based on the models, they found that they could actually finish a beef animal 40% faster with a 30% higher carcass weight than any of the studies previously had shown for this, for this grass-fed uh, system. They also did find that it takes roughly about one and a half to two times the amount of, of land to finish a, an animal um, in this system compared to a feedlot system, which is one of the arguments um, that I often hear with this type of model is, yeah, but it takes more, more land. How are we going to be able to feed the world using this type of model? And, and I guess my, my response to that would be, you know, how are you not going to feed the world with this type of model? And I mean, um, you know, it's been said that we've got about 60 years worth of topsoil left. So how are we going to use a degenerating model, such as a feedlot system, which is reliant on row crops and monocultures, heavily tilled, heavily sprayed um, to, to feed us in the next 60 years. So in the way I view it is I would rather have two, time, two acres that are improving in health year to year than one acre that's going backwards every year. And, and that's just the way, that's how I always uh, address that argument. So, you know, this science is relatively new. These are the four studies that have used soil data as opposed to models um, that, that are out there. So, I mean, the earliest was 2015. So we're talking about basically five years worth of studies. That's it. The problem with these studies is if you wanna do it right, just like the Stanley paper did, it really takes time. It takes four or five years to collect that soil data. This is a slow process. You don't go out one year and then the next year, all of a sudden you've stored 50% more carbon. It just doesn't work that way. So um, I know there are, there are more studies in the works. We've got studies on our farm that are looking into this. Um, but the problem is, is that it's so new, there are still questions that need to be addressed. I also wanna point out this Stanley paper. Um, if anybody's read it or um, wants to read it, one thing they do point out, um, 3.59 tons of carbon per hectare per year. This was the low end of what they found. What they wanted to do was they wanted to err on the side of caution and not be overinflated. So they took the lowest numbers and they were very conservative about what they said their numbers were. So in some cases they were closer to seven and eight, but they took their lowest number just to be conservative. So these are some of the questions that still need to be uh, addressed um, through the research. Um, one is how long will sequestration of carbon be observed? So, you know, we know that 
this happens really quickly when we're switching from a generated system to a regenerating system. So for instance, our farm that's out in uh, Brown County, we know that we're making really big increases over a short amount of time and our data is suggesting that. But is there at some point where this rate is gonna reduce or it's gonna start to plateau? So those are some questions that, that we don't know. Another question is what does this process look like um, across other landscapes and ecoregions? So what is this, you know, a lot of this has been done in fairly um, uh, human environments. So what does this look like in the arid environments out west? You know, can we still see these, these large changes? Um, my guess would probably be a little bit less, but I think we're still going to see the benefits of the system. And then ultimately, how do we educate livestock producers on the benefits of these systems? And what are the hurdles to adoption? We're actually um, in the process of partnering with uh, about 15 different organizations, uh, Michigan State being one of them, along with, uh, let's see, four or five other uh, institutions um, of higher learning, as well as some other nonprofits to help address this um, through a, a large, largely funded research project that we're working on. Uh, we'll have a, um, a social aspect to it as well, uh, where you know we're going to try to fin figure out what some of these some of these hurdles are. Um, some of you guys may have seen this already. Um, so this is a couple life life cycle assessment comparisons, which uh, made their rounds in the news, but I think are really important to address because this is more um, you know this is looking at the science, but this is this is in the face of consumers, which is a, um, you know, one of, one of the, you know, all of us can make this change by being educated as consumers. Um, so on the left-hand side, we've got a life cycle assessment of the Impossible Burger. On the right-hand side, right side, we've got a life cycle assessment from White Oak Pastures, which is a regenerative farm located um, in Georgia. Um, so this one actually came out first. This one came out about a year and a half before this one did. Um, and one of the things that they pointed out um, comparing the Impossible Burger to a beef burger is this one here, which we've already talked about, you know, kilograms of uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, so basically what they came out and they said, you know, we did a full life, uh, Impossible Foods came out and said, we did a full life cycle assessment of our product. And what we found is that for every kilogram of Impossible Burger that we can produce, we're emitting about three and a half kilograms of, of carbon. Then they compared this to a beef burger and pretty stark difference there. I mean, there's no doubt you see this, you go, it makes you question whether you should be eating beef or not, which obviously is, is the whole uh, point of this. If you actually go through and you read this entire life cycle assessment, at no point does it ever mention any difference in beef. It just refers to it as beef burger. It doesn't say regenerative, grass-fed, feedlot, none of that. It just basically lumps all beef into this category here. Well, the gentleman who owns White Oak Pastures, his name's Will Harris. Um, I know Will fairly well, uh, amazing guy, uh, but he's a character as well. Um, he, this didn't really sit right with him. So he actually approached a company named Qantas, which happened to be the third party verifier who did Impossible Foods um, life cycle assessment. So exact same company did both of them. And he invited them to come to his farm to do the exact same process that they did for Impossible Foods. Now he didn't question that this was wrong he said, you know what, this is probably right for a feedlot commodity hamburger. But I don't think that this is the same for my burger is basically what he said. So he had them come out, Qantas come out and do a full life cycle assessment. And lo and behold, what did they find? His total net emissions on his farm is three and a half in favor of carbon sequestration. So not only are they not emitting 30 
almost 31 kilograms for every kilogram of beef he can produce, but they are sequestering or offsetting their carbon footprint by three and a half kilograms for every kilogram of beef that he produces. So I, mean, I look at this system and I, you know, I understand what Impossible Foods is trying to do, um, but I also realize that it, there's some greenwashing behind it as well, unfortunately. Um, they're not telling the whole story. They're telling only this part of the story that, that they want consumers to hear, which is unfortunate. Um, so this is a really important comparison for, for consumers to see. Um, so I'm running short on time here. I was hoping to leave about five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, if, if I go a little bit over, I'd be happy to, you know, go into the, uh, the water cooler and, and answer any questions you guys may have at the end. But now let's take a look at some of the data that we've actually collected on our farm. So this is one of our uh, first pastures that we started doing carbon monitoring on. Um, 2016 was our baseline data. Um, so you can see here in the blue, this is 2016. Orange would be our follow-up, uh, which occurred in 2019. These were both taken the same time of year, um, both in August. Uh, and we have two different ways to compare it here. So here we have a total carbon by percent, and we're looking at it at three different depths. So zero to 10 centimeters, 10 to 25, and 25 to 40 centimeters depth. So this is down to about 18 inches. Um, this is looking at it using bulk density. Those of you who aren't familiar with bulk density, it's basically we're taking a cylinder of known volume and we're harvesting a soil sample in that. Then we extract that soil sample and we basically take its wet weight and then its dry weight. So we try to figure out what that vault, what that um, the weight of that soil is. We've got the known volume, so then we can get we can calculate the density. This is important to compare between different soil samples, different years, and different soil types because we got to be able to compare apples to apples. So we've got to take our bulk density into consideration. So what we see here is between these three years, we've had a slight uptick in percent carbon in zero to 10, uh, no change in 10 to 25, but we saw a, a, a fairly large increase um, here in the 25 to 40, which we see here. We went from 0.57% uh, to 0.71%. And that seems fairly small, but uh, when we look at that of tons of hectare per carbon, or tons, tons of carbon per hectare, we use something called equivalent soil mass, which again allows us to be able to compare um, different, um, different soils from different years, so we make sure we're apples to apples. So equivalent soil mass, we're just used, making sure that we're accounting for the exact amount of, of soil harvested. What we see here is might be a little alarming. We've actually seen that, well, the total um, uh, tons went down in zero to 10. It went down to 10 in 10 to 25, but we saw about a 33% increase in this 25 to 40. So why is that um, promising? Why, why are we actually happy about that? A couple of reasons, one, and this zero to 10 centimeters, the carbon that's located in, in that profile is labile carbon. That's going to turn over no matter what in less than five years through solar respiration, through um, just, just natural processes. And this 10 to 25, that's what we refer to as resistant carbon. So that's going to turn over about uh, every 50 to 100 years. But really what we want is this 25 to 40. This is what we refer to as protected carbon. It's going to be about a, every 100 to 1,000 years before we see any turnover in this carbon. So what's that tell us? That tells us that through the interaction of, of our grazing animals and our plants, our perennial plants, we are pumping carbon deeper into our soil profile where it's protected, where it's going to stay. Nothing's going to happen to that unless for some reason we decide we want to come in and till up our pastures, which isn't going to happen. So this is really encouraging to see this change. I would much rather see this increase here than the increase here, because this would just indicate that we've got a little bit more um, soil organic matter in, in our, our top few inches there. 
Another reason this is important is we did increase slightly our, our percent there in the top. But another thing that's really cool that we did is we decreased our bulk density. So we have less density in our soil profile. So why is that important? Well, that means we have more, our soil's lighter. It has more air pockets, it's, it's, it's airier. And if you recall earlier, I mentioned that the carbon cycle and the water cycle are very much tied together. So let's look at some data on that. So this is the same field, same locations, looking at water infiltration in these, in these, across these two years. So in 2016, we averaged roughly about 30 minutes to infiltrate an inch of water. You can also see our, our standard, standard air is, um, is much, much higher. So we had a lot more variability. In 2019, so in a three years time, the impact that we had on our soils, we went from 30 minutes to roughly about seven minutes, which has huge implications for not only um, the amount of water that we can um, pull into our soil and hold in our soil for times of drought, but also decreasing runoff and impacts that we can have on watersheds. So we were thrilled to see this. Um, so this, this was exciting. And a lot of this was through increase of soil organic matter, but also decreasing the density of our soil, which kind of seems counterintuitive, you know, having a bunch of, you know, thousand pound animals go across, you think you would have more compaction, but that, that's not showing to be the case through our grazing. So real quick, just wanted to look at our, our two, um, two farms that we have. So the blue bars would be our Indian Hill um, and the orange bars would be our Lewis Township, which has been you know, con conventional for 30 years, 30, 40 years. And you can see here just the difference in, in total carbon in all three layers. You know, we're, we're doubling up the amount of, of total carbon. So the whole reason we bought the farm out in Brown County is when the farm in Indian Hill was purchased back in the 60s, it too was a conventional farm. Unfortunately, we didn't have a research department then, so we weren't able to track those changes and how quickly those can occur. But we're able to do that process in Lewis Township or our Brown County farm. So we're, we're trying to track this transition from here to here, here to here, and here to here um, through, through data collection, which we think will be important to help share with, with other um, producers. And then lastly, I just, I think it's important to, to mention the other ecosystem services that of regenerative agriculture. Um, it's not just carbon sequestration, um, but, you know, reduced erosion, increased nutrient cycling, um, increased water infiltration, cleaner watersheds, increased biodiversity. And then one that's really important and kind of is on the news cycle right now are fire breaks. This is something I saw on Twitter um, from, uh, one of the fires out in, in California um, where, you know, they said that a, a library was saved because it was um, all the, uh, the, um, the fire load was, was eaten by goats, which is, which is a pretty cool use of livestock, if you ask me. So that's all I have. Um, thanks so much again for, for joining me. Uh, you know, my contact information is there. Please feel free to reach out. And if you were here to actually learn about um, rotational grazing, there's Jonathan's information. Feel free to reach out to him as well. Chad, that was really incredible. Thank you. I um, oh. wanted to let folks know that there are several presentations tomorrow that relate to what Chad was talking about. In the morning, Peter Bain is going to be talking about uh, carbon cycling and Judith Schwartz is going to be talking about water. And obviously those, uh, those two intersections are really what <clears throat> Chad was talking about with some of these soil studies. Um, Chad and Jim Linney, who is a rotational grazer, and um, Jason Ward, who is <clears throat> also um, grazes, are going to be here uh, at 3.15 tomorrow afternoon for a breakout session. So we'll save the questions that, that have been put on the chat, or I know Chad has also agreed to go to the water cooler if folks would like to join him there. I also wanted to mention that there's a woman named Sally Calhoun from who um, has a ranch in California and is involved nationally um, as a funder of regenerative practices. There are a number of um, 
folks with money who recognize that one of the, the easiest ways to um, invest in climate solutions is to help farmers transition to regenerative agriculture. So some of the questions that I had of Chad, which we can't ask now, but relate to, you know, how do we think about paying farmers for ecosystem services or for carbon and soil? And I think that is the big question on lots and lots of people's mind and why the research that Green Acres is doing um, is so important. So Chad, thank you so much for your work. Uh, the link to the water cooler is now in chat if people would like to join Chad. And again, he'll be back again tomorrow at 3.15.